Sugar. Hello and welcome to Writer Mother Monster. I'm your host, Lara Ehrlich, and our guest tonight is writer Liz Lenz. Before I introduce Liz, I want to thank you all for tuning in and let you know that you can now listen to Writer Mother Monster as a podcast on all major audio platforms or read the interview transcripts at your leisure all on writermothermonster.com. If you enjoy the episode, please also consider becoming a Writer Mother Monster patron or patroness on Patreon. Please also chat with us during the interview. Your comments and questions will appear in our broadcast studio and we'll weave them into our conversation. Now I'm excited to introduce Liz. Liz's writing has appeared in the Huffington Post, the Washington Post, the Columbia Journalism Review, the New York Times, Pacific Standard and others. Her book, Godland, was published in 2019 through Indiana University Press. Her second book, Be Labored, was published in 2020 by Bold Type Books. Liz's essay, All the Angry Women, was also included in the anthology, Not That Bad, edited by Roxanne Gay. Liz received her MFA in creative writing from Lesley University, and she lives in Iowa with her two kids and two cats. She describes writing motherhood in three words as creative and chaotic. Welcome, Liz. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi, it's great to have you. Um, I loved your book. I'm going to hold it up now that I can see what I'm doing. Be Labored, A Vindication of the Rights of Pregnant Women. Fabulous book that we'll talk lots about, um, as well as the themes in, in, inside. Um, but first, I want to know this story um, in your bio elsewhere that our soon-to-be president, Biden, called you, was it a sweetheart? A real sweetheart. A real yes. sweetheart. Well, something that happens often in my life is um, men get mad at me. <laughs> anyway, um, so I was, uh, so that's part of like, if you see me talking about that, that's kind of the thing. But um, I was so lucky to be able to um, co-moderate a forum on LGBTQ issues uh, during the caucuses um, of the presidential candidates at the time. And by luck of the draw, I, um, I, they, they literally did a drawing and uh, they had me uh, ask questions. There were three moderators and they had me ask questions of Joe Biden, Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren. Um, so it was quite the draw. And um, there were a lot of organizations involved. GLAAD was one of them. And um, together as a team uh, with the newspaper I was working for at the time um, and some advocacy organizations, we came up with all of these questions to ask the candidates about you know, their, their past supporting bills or laws or programs that had impacted the LGBTQ community in some way. Um, and so I think people who know about this story probably don't know that I didn't even write half of those questions, the questions that I asked. But, you know, they were they were carefully written and uh, researched and everybody got to say. So when I got up to um, interview Biden, I asked him about his uh, about his support of a crime bill that had, um, you know, that had, as we all know, crackdowns on crime always affect the most marginalized. So I asked about that and how it had affected the trans community. And his he was taken really off guard by the question, which was surprising to me. Um, but the um, but he kind of pushed back and was like, no, it hasn't. It's fine. Everything's fine. And um, when he was done, I I pushed him a little bit on it. I was like, well, actually, the data shows that, you know, that's not entirely the case. And, um, and you know, we continued from there. But as we were walking off the stage, he looked at me and he goes, well, you're a real sweetheart. And we walked away. And um I'm all about accountability for leaders. And while I am so happy he is our president elect and soon to be our president, um, 
I, I did tweet that that's what he had said. And, um, and yeah, I just tweeted it, put my phone down because I had to get ready to interview the next person. And by the time the event was over, that had gone viral and, um, I was getting a lot of feedback about it. So it is um, it is a thing that happened. My kids think it's the greatest thing ever. I didn't even tell them. Um, a lot of other people informed them that this happened. So my nine-year-old daughter just thinks it's great. She's like, remember when the guy who's going to be our president was kind of sarcastic to you? And I'm like, yes, I remember. But it's hard to forget yeah. that story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this ties into some of the themes in your book, and I want to get to that, too, about um, often men who have strong opinions about women and what we should act like and what we should do with our bodies. Um, but before we get to that, so you have a nine-year-old daughter. Um, tell us, you know, I know you have two children. Mm -hmm. How old is yes. your other child? I have a nine-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son, and um, yeah, they are, they are, I'm so lucky to be able to have them in pandemic. So they, they go between me and their dad's house, and, um, and they're kind of the only people I see these days, um, with the exception of the one friend, you know, who I'm potting with, mm -hmm. and so um, it's, it's, it's great to have them. I feel bad for them in a way because like before when I could have like adult conversations regularly, I treated them more like children, but now I kind of, I talk to them <laughs> more like adults now. Like I'm all like, oh my gosh, like look at this thing I saw on Twitter. It's gonna be, I love it. And they're like, we have no idea why a joke about Mike Pence's fly would be funny. And I'm like, oh, well let me explain. And they're like, please stop. We don't <laughs> care. You know, I think the other day I was explaining uh, performance wool to them because I gotten like this workout shirt for running outside. And I was like, oh my God, it's performance wool. It's so cool because it like wicks away the sweat but also being a light underlayer. And literally my daughter was like, stop. We don't care. We are children. And so that's amazing. I know it's funny how the pandemic changes our relationships with our kids in in sort of some sneaky ways and some really kind of obvious ways too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think it's good. I think our relationship has gotten better. Um, my daughter and I have instituted when she's at my house, we do like a nightly tea time and we sit and sip tea and you know talk about things. Which you know for a nine year old, she's like very interested in when she's going to get her period and what's going to happen to her buddy and when she's going to get, you know, and so all, all those other things. And I, it's okay to say that because we have a little podcast together and um, which we started in pandemic, which I distribute through my newsletter. And so those are some of the things she's very curious about. So we talk a lot about them. Talk a bit more about that podcast and how does it work? So like what, <laughs> what's it called? Where can people find it? Um, they can subscribe to your newsletter. Yeah. So I, I have a sub stack like, you know, every shitty media man and me. Uh, no, there's a lot of great people on the sub stack platform. Um, but I, I have a sub stack newsletter. I really love it. Um, it's and my back in kind of the beginning of pandemic when I was listening to kind of kid friendly podcasts with my kids about um, the about COVID just to kind of explain things and talk about things to them. Um, my daughter got really excited. She wanted to start a podcast. Well, at the time, I didn't have the time because I didn't know anything about like audio recording and it was going to require like, you know, getting a new computer and a mic and all this kind of stuff. And so um, finally, um, finally, I did my due diligence. I talked to people and learned about it. And we started her Rad Ladies podcast where she uh, has planned on interviewing mostly rad ladies, um, some men about um, the things she 
she wants to talk about. So, I mean, you know, it's anything from dinosaurs to menstruation from oh. Ad Atlantis to witches to, it's a little random. Um, and I do really uh, want to protect my kids' internet privacy. So this isn't like a podcast that you're going to be able to like download on Stitcher. I distribute it through my newsletter and most of the episodes are going to be subscriber only. So I'm, I love my kids. I want to encourage them, but I also want to really walk that line of giving them their privacy so we don't use her name. I try really hard not to use my kids' names or faces online. Um, and that's been an interesting conversation with her, you know, talking to her about like, why I want to do that because you know she's like it's fine I'm fine with it I'm like mm, but you're nine you know how much you might feel differently about this when you're 18 when you're 34 and running for public office right like um and so I want to be able to encourage them um but also protect them it's just such a hard space to walk as a parent and you know I don't know if I do it perfectly all the time but I hope that if I ever screw up and they get mad at me about it that I'll be able to say I'm sorry you know and be like yeah, that's a screw up and I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, it's something that I think a lot about as a, as a public writer, um, and, and, and a mother. So, yeah, I think about that a lot too. I don't have my daughter's, um, face or name on social media or anywhere on the internet either. I sort of figure when she's old enough to make that choice and have agency, that's when, you know, when she can choose for herself. Although I respect others' decision to put their kids on, yes. that's fine too. But yeah, I I I really try hard not to be prescriptive about my choices. One of the ways that I became a writer was I was like very frustrated and nobody wanted to publish my writing, so I started a blog. You know, like like everybody. And then I started having children, so suddenly my blog became a mom blog, right? Um, just by purely using my uterus that I became a niche category. And um and so in in the in the process of motherhood, um, for many people, I know motherhood is accomplished in different ways and parenthood is accomplished in different ways. Um, but if you, if you give birth to a child, that kid is still part of you in a way, and your story is still their story. Like um, a lot of our political dialogue tries to cleave the two apart, but really, you know, for the longest time, we're the same organism. And so, you know, when writing about my kids in the early days, their story was my story. And I clearly remember the moment when I was like, aha, our stories are now different. And that's the day I nuked my blog. I literally just hit delete. I didn't even back anything up, which kind of in like hindsight, maybe I should have backed things up. But um, I just hit delete it all on the WordPress. But I remember I was trying to take a picture of them for the blog. And again, like I said, I don't, have not done this always perfectly. And if you want to judge me for this, don't worry, I judge myself too. But like, uh, I was trying to take a picture and my daughter said, I don't want to be in a picture. And she was four at the time. And I was like, we're done here. That's it. You know, like that I, I felt like I was pushing a boundary and she had drawn a clear one. And that night, I just nuked my blog. I was like, it's over. We're done. And we're going to find new ways of um, telling our stories while still being honest, but also trying to respect um, them as autonomous human beings. So, yeah. How did that play into the writing of your two books? Oh, you know, it's so funny. My kids, um, I mean, for most of their li their like conscious lives, kids don't really remember stuff at, before the age of three. Um, so for most of their conscious lives, I've been writing books, and um, and and they're like, oh, you have two books and two kids, so one's about each of us. Oh, like, no. no, actually, I write about other things, and that really kind of offends them. They're like, why are we not good enough? I'm like, no, mm -mm, actually, religion's far more interesting, you know. And uh, I love to troll children, just love to troll the shit out of them. But the um, my other favorite thing is to talk shit about kids too. Uh, but we don't have to do that in this public forum. But uh, not my kids, other people's 
kids don't worry about it. They, but that was <laughs> <laughs> delete it. <laughs> All of this. Too late. <laughs> Cancel myself into the face of the sun. But the, um, they, uh, yes. It's so it, it, it's a real hard balance because I also write about my divorce and I still have to co-parent with my, um, kid's father and now his wife. And so, you know, I want to write honestly, um, but I also want to respect boundaries. And so um, it's it's a weird balance. I know some people who think probably I say too much. I know other people who say more, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant tightrope. And yeah, and that's when I was writing Belabored, um, that was something I did think about a lot. Like, how am I going to write this? What am I going to say? You know, because there's some tough stuff about my relationship with their dad, you know, and I really tried to think like, you know, when they're 18 or something and they come to this book, am I going to be able to say that I was thoughtful and considerate, but also honest? And um, once again, I'm not going to claim I've done things perfectly, but um, I, when I was going through the fact checking phase of the book, because the book was fact checked, um, that I remember going through some of my notes and seeing a little note I had written to myself that just had said, you know, I said, you know, dear name and name of my kids, um, your story is my story. And in so many ways, and I'm so sorry <laughs> for that, you know, and, uh, and that I, I remember reading that and being like, oh, yeah, that's a that's a tension. And I think that's a tension we have with all of our parents. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just not mm -hmm. always so public. Yeah, and I want to get into, um, like I said, the themes of the book and pregnancy and our bodies. But um, first, I wonder, so for anyone listening, and if you have questions, please, um, I'll pause and say, please ask questions. If you comment on YouTube or Facebook, the questions will appear here in StreamYard and we'll answer them. But um, for any listeners who are writing memoir or mm -hmm. nonfiction that draws upon their own lives, um, I'm sure that they, and myself who does that sometimes are experiencing that tension and mm. can you talk a little bit about the logistics of writing um of writing personal experience and so how do you find that balance like technically on the page um, Where do you, how do you pull back yeah oh i my my approach is to go as far as possible and pull back through the editing. Often too much is really just a writing problem. It's a style problem. It's a craft problem. If something's not ringing, if, if something feels like too icky, too gross on the page, um, that's, that's, you know, that's a sign. Maybe not that you went too far, but just like the, the craft isn't there, the approach isn't there. So um, I remember, so I'm one of eight kids. I'm number two of eight kids. And so anytime I'm going to write something, it's going to have ripple effects onto other people's lives. And I remember um, back, I didn't know any writers and I was like in my early twenties and I was like Googling how to become a writer. And there, because I live in Iowa um, and just down the road, I live just down the road from Iowa city where, you know, you go there, you spit, you hit a writer you know um and and so a friend of mine was like here let me introduce you to this writer barbara robinette moss who wrote this wonderful book change me into zeus's daughter and she's one of she passed away um from cancer a few years ago um but she was one of many kids writes about abuse um which is the topic i talk about too and i remember asking her when's it when's how much is too much, you know, because also in families, even if they have betrayed you, you still love them. And um, how much do you sell them out on the page? And she, um, you know, she said to me, she goes, it's your story. If it happened to you, it's your story. So um, I've really taken that to heart. Um, and I have had times when I've had clashes uh, with my family about the things that I've written. Um, and mostly they're just upset that I said things that they didn't 
want to be said, but um, we all still talk. Um, <laughs> although there was like a good like year and a half when my mom didn't talk to me, but they're fine. Actually, it was a nice break. It was just really a refreshing time. Uh, sorry, mom. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, and, you know, so my, I think my approach now is to write as much as you can to tell the story in the most compelling way possible. And then when I, and I trust my editors to have my ass you know, to, to cover it. Um, and, uh, that's, that's my approach. Um, and I know other people are far more careful. Um, but I also think there, there's, oh my God. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, and, um, she's got to be used to this by now. But the, don't worry. I'll hear about it later. Um, there is, um, oh God, what was I going to say? It doesn't matter anymore. Your editors I, have I, your ass. <laughs> oh yeah, you trust your editors yeah. to cover your ass and to protect you. And I, when I send in things that are deeply personal, I always say, okay, has this gone too far? And another thing I do is I have a sister who's a victim of um, assault and I check everything with her because she's a victim and I never want her to feel more victimized. Um, another thing that I always think about too is I think about um, nieces and nephews. Um, and so I'm always try. I'm always careful to, I hope, and I'm sure, I'm sure my siblings have a lot of feedback, but, um, I do remember, and we could talk, I could talk about this for hours, but I do remember one time sending in a bunch of writing to my brother and, um, he well I have three brothers um but I'm specifically talking about my brother who's 16 months younger than me we're very close and I sent him a bunch of writing that I had done a lot of it hasn't ever seen the light of day but I had done about our family and I said am I wrong you know like fact check me and he sent me this lovely letter which I actually talk about in the book where and I quote part of it in the book where um you know he said to me like I might not remember things the same way you do I might not um I might not even agree with the things that you learned from our similar situations, but he's like, but you, you, you need to say what you need to say. And, and he's like, and that's not, and me making it about myself is selfish in a way. And it was just like this wonderful, gracious letter that once again said, your story is your story and you have to tell it. And um, so often I think the most necessary stories don't get told because, you know, because of fear and power dynamics. And so, um, yeah, I always try to go, go far and then pull back, but it has been a learning. It has been a learning curve. And um, yeah. And don't worry, my sisters, they let me know. <laughs> Yeah, I well, that's good, right? It's <laughs> good to, oh, to know and not have someone simmering. Yeah, oh, yeah. I would say I don't come from a family of simmerers. We're just <laughs> we just blow up, and that's yeah. great, you know, because simmering is actually the scariest to me. It's true. I know. I think my family is a bunch of simmerers, so mm. I appreciate people who are just who just tell you what they have in mind. <laughs> Um, but speaking of fear and power dynamics, I think that's a good entry into your actual book here. And I'm going to hold it up again for anyone who didn't see it the first time, Belabored, A Vindication of the Rights of Pregnant Women. So can you tell us, um, just give us the elevator pitch for the book for anyone who, who hasn't seen the, the jacket cup. Yeah, so it is part memoir, it's part manifesto about the the about the politics of our bodies during the nine months of pregnancy. And I try to make it as accessible as possible. I acknowledge, you know, there's many uh, roads to parenthood um, and, and, and there's also a choice not to be a parent uh, or sometimes that choice is not a choice. Sometimes that's just made for people even if they wanted another choice. And so, but what I think is a core issue and I, and I feel like the nine and I actually include, well, I actually include the four trimesters of 
of pregnancy and um, birth, I really feel like they encapsulate a dissonance, a political and cultural dissonance about the way we police bodies in America. And um, so, that's that's what this book is and i you know i talk about the history of pain medicine um i go to philadelphia and take a serial killer tour um so it's not all like gory birth stories i try to i talk about like i have like a whole chapter basically just about a turkey sandwich which is one of my favorite chapters <laughs> and it's so funny in addition to being educational <clears throat> excuse me political um, thought provoking. It's just, I think anyone listening to this interview senses your personality and your sense of humor and sense of joy. And that comes through in the book too. So it's quite a, I think quite an accomplishment to get all of that in there into this memoir slash manifesto. Thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. It was very hard to write because when I sold the book, I was one kind of mother. I was married. I was upper middle class in the Midwest, two children, a boy and a girl. I had done it. But then when I sat down to write the book, you know, I was like, I was a single mom and still had my kids, still lived in the Midwest, but, you know, I was relying on my parents for money for Christmas presents and um, and really struggling. My dog is pulling on the computer cord right it's now. It's okay. So, my cat is scratching um, at the door. So <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> pandemic uh, situation. Yeah, I'm, I might have to pull her up here in a second, but That's um, fine. But, but yeah, and so I was like, you know, I was a very different person when I sat down to write, and a very different mother. I was a hugely different mother. Okay, one second, I'm gonna That's pick fine. up this dog and she's gonna <laughs> stop causing problems. We welcome dogs on the show, kids and dogs. Yes. Oh, especially really cute, tiny ones. <laughs> she's more like a squirrel, I mean, than oh dog. So. Wow. What's her name? <laughs> her name is Jolene, and oh. she's a um, she's a Dachshund Maltese mix, and um, she we we tried to go for a walk today, but we couldn't because it's snowing and her little paws are cold. Um, <laughs> just pour one out for Jolene, but um, yes, I am not I'm different not kind sure. of mother. Different kind. Thank you. Different kind of mother um, than I was. Then you know who had even proposed the book, and a lot of my perspectives on issues had changed. You know, um, I think a great example of that was the pain medicine issue. You know, like I was like, oh, I'm going to write this chapter. It's going to be all like, hell yeah, pain medicine. We all need epidurals. Let's have an epidural right now. And upon further reflection. <laughs> And um, thank you, Maggie. Jolene loves you too. Jolene loves everyone. <laughs> um, but upon further reflection and further research, you know, I was like, actually, the history of pain medicine is really complicated and has been used, you know, um, for forced hysterectomies and, um, you know, and 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 actually, just like the way that. Uh, the way that so many life-saving operations for women have been developed were, you know, developed by doctors doing experiments on enslaved women without their consent and also without pain medicine. And so, and so I think what would have been a very different kind of book suddenly became far more nuanced, you know, um, and I, I almost bought my way out of the book contract because I didn't get a lot of money for it. And uh, but a friend was like, just write it, just write it all into the book, write all the problems with the book into the book. And so um, I did. That's a wise thing to say, actually. <laughs> yeah, because it is an, um, it is not a simple concept or theme, right? Pregnancy and all of the history of medicine around it. It's um, it's very fraught. So working mm -hmm. that into the book is was a brilliant thing to do, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about, though, how your perspective changed between selling the book and writing the book. Um, what was it about your um, your that period of motherhood or your situation after a divorce that then led you to maybe a deeper contemplation of these issues and um, more nuanced approach? You know, I think um, 
it, it was one, it was a research and, um, you know, actually reading about and talking and talking to women in my circle. I'll give an example of that is that uh, my, um, my, I, I, you know, I had viewed um, eating while pregnant as this very restrictive kind of a thing, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 I found it very um, like a judgmental experience for people. And I think this has a lot to do with my body size before I was pregnant and what my body size happened to be while I was pregnant. And um, and 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 I was privileged enough to like you know be able to just like eat a bunch of Cheetos and not have people scrutinize me um, because I was quote unquote you know like an acceptable size and so that was allowed and then all of a sudden I'm pregnant and I'm in this world where like my eating is scrutinized and I'm like what but you know I remember talking about this and uh, with my neighbor. And she was like, I found it freeing because for the first time in my life, I was able to feed myself without people judging what I was eating. Wow. You know, she was like, um, because of just a different body experience, she was able to, you know, when people were like, are you, should, are you sure you should be, it, she would be able to say, no, I'm feeding the child within me. Like, no, actually I'm anemic and I need to eat like steak, you know, like, no, yeah. actually. Um, and so I wanted to you know I wanted to pay respect to those stories and 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 create a space for you know alternative narratives but but the fact being that it is still um, it's still an issue of control right and how we control the way women eat and the way um, and the way unruly bodies eat right and the way and so um, and so there was a lot, a lot was changing my perspective, just throwing myself into the research. I mean, I read like millions of history of pregnancy books and talked to tons of people and, you know, went places and did things. And I also, you know, but also the way I was getting treated as a different kind of mother was becoming very apparent. It, this happened when I was researching my first book, Godland. You know, I noticed when I would go into like conservative spaces and my divorce was like in process then, like we were still in like therapy. And so if I, and I was like experimenting cause I'm just a jerk. So I'm like, okay, I'll do this interview with a wedding ring on and I'll do the sixth one without it on and just kind of see how people treat me. And obviously it's not a scientific experiment, but I was getting treated very differently based upon whether people thought I was like a single mom or a non-mom or married or not married. And I was like, oh, come on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Can you can you think of an example? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um. I've got two examples and one will be from a non-book one just because it's more recent, but I think it's just fascinating to me um, was, yeah, when I went to, um, it, for for my book, Godland, I went on this week retreat with, um, with Baptist ministers and their wives, which tells you a lot, you know, it's and their wives. And I, um, and when I showed up, I was not wearing my wedding ring. You're just kind of like there and i was having a hard time talking to people you know like if i sat down next to a minister and started talking to him it was very like mm, 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 mm. but then if i then finally i was like oh no i you know i'm not an idiot like okay so i know what this is about so it's like oh do you want to see pictures of my kids and my house and my husband you know and then boop, now we're talking you know um you know, was I safe or was I unsafe? And whether a woman is safe or not, you know, depends on she married. Is she performing gender in the way that I want her to perform gender? Um, and and yes, now sometimes the motherhood is erased or it's not helpful to the narrative. I, I, I recently wrote um, about Amy Coney Barrett and how she uses her white motherhood as, um, kind of as a shield to hide a lot of the really anti-mother, anti-parent um, policies. Um, as, as we saw a recent ruling that now prohibits women from um, getting um, 
that uh, abortion pill. I, I don't want to call it that, but that's what I'm just going to call it uh, for shorthand. Um, online. Now you have to go in and get it. And that's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I had written about that and about how throughout history, white women have used their motherhood to, you know, perpetuate some pretty evil stuff like uh, school segregation. And, um, and the Catholics got real mad at me. And uh, what was that Bill Donahue guy wrote this whole thing that was like, you know, how dare this woman attack motherhood in such a fashion? She must be anti motherhood. And I'm like, well, I'm a mom. And I would like have a million kids if it was a good idea. Like, I really love being a mom. Like, no, I was like, huh, interesting that. Oh, interesting that you know my motherhood is not convenient for your narrative about the attack on on motherhood. So um, yeah, those are just little snippets. Yeah, and actually now we're circling back a little bit to something I wanted to talk more about, which is men's perception and policing of women, particularly um, women as mothers, and what we should and should not be, and what our body should and should not look like. And you said early on that um, men often get mad at you. <laughs> so I think you demonstrated that a little bit here. Well, I want to I wanna kind of um, add a little nuance on to your question very respectfully, is mm -hmm. women often police women's performance of gender far more than men do. Um, um, you know, I and I think this is best encapsulated um, I, I, in the book. I kind of write about how in extreme performances of gender is when women are able to ask for things, um, pregnancy, marriage, uh, planning a wedding. Right. That's the whole bridezilla thing. She, all of a sudden, this is this woman who feels empowered to ask for things and, and maybe she never felt she could before. And um, and so but I will say, you know, anybody who's been pregnant it's it's not it's nine times out of ten it's not a man sitting there saying you think you should be eating drinking all that caffeine you know nope Nope, 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 nope. And I, so I think that's an important part of the nuance of the conversation. I'm not trying to hashtag not all men here, but I am trying to say that like we need to be more nuanced in our dialogue about men versus women. Um, and, you know, this is why like I have a lot of problems with like, hell yeah, vote for women. I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to like I'm. I don't know why I, I live in a state that has a lady governor and it's going terribly. It's just awful. Uh, and so I, I think that that's really that, you know, it's it's a, it's kind of true, but it's also a little bit reductive. And when we miss the nuance, we miss the ways in which patriarchy is internalized and the way we internalize it and the way we as women like do corrective behavior on other women. It's obviously the same with racism too, right? Like we can think we're good, but really we need to start thinking about the way we have internalized uh, harmful norms. Um, but, but what was the second part of your question? Why do men get mad at me? Um, I think first of all, <laughs> I'm a, I mean, I'm just like I'm a loud person who asks questions a lot. Um, I deserve, I mean, people deserve to get uh, mad at me sometimes, but I do think that there is something about a woman who has nothing to lose. And that happened, I think, when, when I got my divorce, it was, um, I mean, it was, they grew up very religious um, and uh, was taught that that was not an option. You know, you don't do that. And once again, I will say my parents, we've been on a journey and they were very supportive of me um, when I made that decision and are still supportive now. But it was it was really scary, you know, to, to just say, OK, everything that I grew up learning I'm now going to turn my back on wholeheartedly and I'm going to leap off this abyss. Basically, it felt like jumping off a cliff. And um, and in that process, I learned I'm going to be fine. Do you know what I mean? I learned that I could I learned a couple things. I learned that my happiness was not ancillary, that it was actually the this is actually the point and that um, 
and that, you know, that all people deserve to have good and happy lives. And it's not selfishness to want that. It's not selfishness to ask for it. It's not selfishness to take the time you need to write, right? It's not selfishness to go for the career that you want. And I think we often uh, tell women that, no, no, you know, you've got to die on the cross. Um, and you don't have to, like, walk down from that cross, you know, go do what you need to do. It's not, it's, it's not great up there. It sucks. And, um, and so I, and I, I kind of realized I have nothing to lose here. And I started making bolder choices. I started writing more boldly um, in a way that I didn't before. I started asking harder questions, not just of myself, but of the people I was talking to, you know. Um, and and maybe I don't think it was a sudden change, obviously. Maybe it was also getting more confident um, in who I was as a writer and a career in a career person. It was trusting myself more. Um, but I do think that there is something very powerful about a woman who walks into a room and says, I don't need you. I'm here because I want to be here. Um, doing the podcast with my daughter, we interviewed a witch expert. And she said that the first witch trials were not about medicine and healing. Uh, they were just women who were independently wealthy. You know, and that just was a slap in the face reminder that a woman who is who doesn't need all that other stuff is is a real threat, you know, and a real destabilizing threat to power. Um, so I think that's some of the dynamics. I don't want to give myself too much credit. I'm also kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> so there, there's probably that there. I'm sure somebody's listening. It's like, yeah, but you also kind of suck. It's like, fine, <laughs> throw that one in there. It's, it's okay. <sighs> Yeah, like, but I, I do don't think I will I, to the hypothetical person who I just invented in my mind. I will push back a little bit and say what we value as obnoxious in a woman. How would we see it in a man? Right. Like an antagonist is in a man is far more valued a characteristic than it is in a woman. Um, but, you know, I also might just be annoying. It's fine. <laughs> Oh, you know, you make it hard to follow up with a cogent question because your answers are just so amazing. And then I'm like, and then I find myself nodding and I'm like, oh, now I have to ask you something. But um, you know, that's my I, evil plan. <laughs> no, it's amazing. Um, I'm fascinated um, by by what what you by the nuance that you added to that question which thank you for doing that because it is such an important topic to discuss about how women are our own worst enemies both of each other and of ourselves um and maggie i'll show her comment here yeah so it is a great topic and thank you liz for pointing it out and talking about it um I've noticed that in in moms groups myself, I have an amazing one in Boston that is full of like non-judgmental, bold, like tell it like it is moms. And then there were a few others I tried where it's like you ask a question and then you get 50 comments about how you're doing everything wrong, <laughs> right? Can I tell you about the time I got yeah. kicked out of a mom's group? On Please Facebook? do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is such a good story. So this map, so I live in the Midwest, obviously, and uh, relatives in Minnesota, which I don't know if you guys know this, it's the land of 10,000 lakes. <laughs> and so we, well, my mom says Boston, yeah, she, yeah went, Boston. she went to Worcester State. Um, and so, uh, my, uh, so, you know, I'm like been taking my small baby to the lake, right. And just like walking with her into the water and like sitting her, you know what I mean? Whatever. It's just like a baby. She can't like, go anywhere. So it's like dip you in the water, shake you off, throw you on a towel, right? No big, yeah. no big deal. But this, this woman posts and she's, and this is, this is a group of very intelligent, successful women. And I don't know why I was in this group, but they, um, so woman goes, we're taking our baby to the lake. What, what kind of life, this three month old baby, we're taking our three month old baby to the lake. 
what kind of life vest should we give her? Oh, no. And I go, well, as long as you don't toss her overboard, I think she's going to be fine. And people just ignore my comment. And they're, like, suggesting all these other things. And then she gets, and then it's like this thread goes on for a couple of days. And then she, she got a life vest for her baby and she posted a picture of her baby floating in the bathtub with the life vest on. And it's just this, like, chubby baby, like, <laughs> in the bathtub, I, no less. <laughs> I was trying it out, and I'm sure she's an amazing mom. But I replied, I replied, "Is this cruelty to babies?" <laughs> and then suddenly, I couldn't access the group. Oh, no. <laughs> I think wow. probably it might have been a little bit more involved, a little bit more snarky, but I think it was like L M A O. Is this baby cruelty? Should I report this? Oh my god! Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, yeah. That's not out of line with the type of things I see, um, or I did see because I, I I did not stick around in those moms groups. But. No, you got to find your people. You got to mm -hmm. find your people. I mean, that's true for all aspects of your life, right? Like it's not yeah. just, it's not just um, parenthood. It is, you know, your writing, you have to find the people you trust to critique your writing. Um, you know, you've got, you got to find your, your people. And uh, yes, we, people are very good at policing um, choices. And I think the problem is not that we, that, you know, obviously the problem wasn't that she was getting a, um, a a little life best for her baby, which is wonderful. But like, I think the problem becomes when you say, you know, like now all people need to do it my way, or you know, I'm somehow morally superior. But I think there's something in this where if we look at the system, so it's easy to like blame women and write viral posts about like, oh, blow up in a mommy's group or mom bloggers are fighting again. But I think we also need to realize the way in which women have limited power. Mm -hmm. And when you raise somebody to say you, your whole goal in your life is to have children and now you have children and that's also the only way you can exert control over your world, then of course, you know, we start fighting about like whether baby boppies or I don't know, my, my youngest is now seven. So I don't even know. I, I recently learned that we don't do rock and plays anymore because my friend was having a baby. I was like, you have to get a rock and play. She was like, Oh, they've killed babies. And I was like, Oh, oh. don't get, don't get a rock. And play. <laughs> don't do that. Um, things change, but you know, it's, it's, that we and that when you create this closed system where women can't have power and can't access power and that their status as a mother is the only way in which they can access power mm -hmm. then i think that's the real problem to critique is and that's the real source of the you know the behavior so i you know it, it is funny i always click on those posts and when the mommy blackers are fighting but i also i do think it helps us to like put it in the context of let's like look at the system that we've created and um and and critique that mm -hmm. rather yeah. than shaming individual behavior yeah no that's a great point um i want to take a, like a, a leap back and ask what inspired you to write this book in the first place mm. well i gave birth twice uh i um i was when back in 2015 um, and probably 2014, I was writing a series uh, for Jezebel about mythology and motherhood. And I was talking about, um, you know, myths and non-myths, because uh, sometimes they're not always myths, um, about you know, like the wandering, the wandering womb and those kinds of things. And it was, it was doing really well. Um, and, you know, I kind of fact check them, see where they came from and kind of say, do these exist now? And what, you know, how do we, what kind of myths do we rely on? And I was trying to sell a very different book and nobody would buy it. Um, in fact, and I think this is about like early 2016. Um, I'm sending this book out, um, which was just a book on womanhood and whatever. Um, and uh, and I remember editors being like, mm, "This has too much religion in it. Americans are not interested in religion." 
sad trombone because the <laughs> 2016 election happened. But a very wonderful editor who was at Norton at the time, Remy Colley, was like, I like this book, but I can't sell it. But she's like, but also the book I really want is I want you to take your writing from Jezebel and turn it into a book. She's like, because, you know, people pitch us books on motherhood all the time. She's like, but I don't see books like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I want a book that really gets to the heart of things. And, um, and then, um, so we work together on a proposal and, uh, and, and that's kind of where the book, the, the literal genesis of the book came out of. But, you know, I heard Maggie Nelson, the wonderful writer say mm -hmm. once, you know, that every, every story is a story of a body. And I think about that too often. And I think pregnancy is a great way of, um, of really encapsulating that and talking about that, how um, you cannot separate flesh from reality and your reality, right? And um, and I, and I think about that often when when I'm writing. You know, how how does this interest me? Why am I interested? What why do people care? And how does this affect the body, like the fleshy reality of our lives? Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think that was the theoretical motivation of the book too. Yeah. Did you always know you wanted to be a mother? No, mm -mm. I, um, I, God, my mom might fact trip me on this, but I think I was always kind of like, no way, um, I'm not gonna be a mom. Uh. <laughs> that was <laughs> me. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I was like, I don't, I don't need no kids. I'm gonna, you know. And it, but first of all, by the way, choosing not to be a mother or not, but it was perfectly wonderful, fine choice. Absolutely. Um, absolutely, no shame for that. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I married somebody who wanted kids. And um, I also, I also, I don't think I was fully against it. I just knew that I needed to do a lot of like self work you know, mm -hmm. um, and that was really hard work um, to do. I was in therapy a lot. Uh, I had to go through some things um, with with my lovely mother, who's still commenting. Love you, mom. <laughs> um, we, you know, we had to go through things. We had to talk about things and to come to some understanding. Um, and and I think part of that healing made me be made me be excited uh, for kids. Um, I, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, right? Everybody's journey is so complicated, um, but I'm so, I'm so glad I did. Um, How did you change when you became a mother? I know that's such a, like, big question, but. Um, I remember my mom asking me on my first Mother's Day, because my daughter was born in March, and then it was like May, and she was like, how do you feel now that you're a mom? I was like, I feel like myself, but fatter. Oh, I actually put that in the book. It's like literally in the book. And I like, I don't know. I mean, maybe people who know me might think differently and fight with me on this, but I, I honestly don't. I, of course, my perspective on some issues changed and, you know, things that I thought I would always do, you know, or like now I don't do them, you know, like I was never going to give them like sugary yogurt. And now I'm just like, please eat a protein. I don't <laughs> care if it's chock full. Just eat freaking protein and stop yelling at me. I don't care. Yeah. Um, you know, my 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 patience for battles uh, was dwindled. And um, I but yeah, I, I you know obviously it changes your cell structure, but I don't think if it, 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 and it also, I think maybe made opinions that I might've been softer on a little bit more extreme. <laughs> yeah. Can you, you know, give but, one example of one? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I, I mean, you know, I'll say this science, you know, I always kind of just believed a doctor, you know, there's science, there's medicine, and we can trust the doctors. And I'm not trying to undermine faith in science and medicine, but we do need to understand the ways that uh, science and medicine 
fail us and how a lot of it's built on misogyny and white supremacy. And, you know, I, I remember feeling very let down by the medical establishment after the birth of my daughter, um, you know, which was very traumatic. And, you know, I had postpartum hemorrhaging, but nobody would tell me what it was. All I knew was I was just bleeding and passing out. I didn't know anything that was going on. They wouldn't even tell me how many stitches I got after. And I loved my doctor, but she was so condescending about that. You know, I remember just gaining tons and tons of weight. And I was like, it just like, I gained like almost 80 pounds with both pregnancies. And it was just like, my body was just like, whoop, now you look like a kid in, you know, the chocolate factory who chewed the wrong gum. It's <laughs> fine, but so so, I mean, nurses were just like, lay off the milkshakes. I'm like, I haven't had a milkshake in 10 months. You know, leave me. And also, even if I had a milkshake, right? leave me alone, you know. Um, and wow. I, yeah, I remember feeling really it, like I had gone in with this just blind trust and acceptance of the medical establishment. And I came out being like, you know, I got in and been like, we don't need midwives. And then I came out being like, you know what? Gotta say, there's something to that. Um, so, yeah, I think I, it shouldn't take personal experience for people to listen and change and grow. But some of those uh, things were very helpful in me radicalizing. I mean, my, my perception of women and work and the emotional labor we do and the loads that we carry that radically changed, um, you know, and um, what are you doing? Sorry, my dog <laughs> is just, what are you doing? Stop it, Jolene. But um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little weirdo. But the yes, so a lot, uh, a lot of that. I I wouldn't say it changed, you know, because I was always like, yeah, this sucks. But I think it changed from me being like, this sucks to like, let's burn it down, <laughs> revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. That's how I feel too. Very radicalized about motherhood and, and particularly like women's right to be creative while being mothers and women's right to have jobs while being mothers that we need to be well-rounded people if that's what we want. I mean, yeah. I have friends who are who want to be home full time and they should be, you know, able to do that as well too. There should be structures in place to make that possible. But um right. Yeah, I guess so we are, <laughs> I could talk all night with you, but I think I'll just wrap up with um, with some actionable advice since you are a mother who is balancing motherhood with writing, with um, advocacy, with so many things with, with work. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I've kind of given up on asking about balancing everything because right. it kind of seems like there is no balance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how do you how do you prioritize your craft? Um, I first of all, um, it, it changes. My kids are older now, you know, so um, it, this this is this changes. But I I I remember reading a blog post, and I wish I could find it because I think about this blog post all the time that I had read when I was pregnant with my daughter, and it, that it, it talked about like my my writing is my career and it is a priority and that means it's a priority over um folding clothes it's a priority over raking the lawn it's a priority over all those things that we somehow think we need to do but are really just like ancillary to the the task of living and so i've always kind of thought like look um I need to take care of my kids, obviously, but also part of taking care of my kids is being a fully well-rounded human being. And they need a mother whose life is not all about them because one day they're going to leave me and they're going to be like, get a friend. So uh, <laughs> move on. And so, um, and so I prioritize my writing and my, cause it is my career. And I, especially in those early days, you know, I'd wake up at like three and 4 AM and then my stupid, but babies would wake up with me and, and, and you know and I'd be like okay but 
it, it felt like stealing time, but you're not stealing that time if it belonged to you in the first place. So um, in my bedroom right now are baskets and baskets of unfolded laundry. I don't wear, I don't match socks anymore. We have this thing called the sock basket and I just dump. Oh my God. I do not know what my dog is doing, but I swear to God, it's getting weird in here. Um, <laughs> but she, um, you know, it's and, and we have a sock basket. I don't match socks. Screw matching socks, socks, what the hell? <laughs> and, um, and they, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff I don't do and I refuse to do. And if I have time, maybe, but, um, also I need to sleep. Um, it doesn't all happen, right? Like it doesn't all get done. And I have just chosen to prioritize my work over other things. You know, does that mean that some days I don't work out? Yep. Yeah, you know, does that mean some days emails don't get answered? Yeah, you know, phone calls don't get returned. Um, you know, text messages don't get returned because this is my time and I worked so hard, you know, for it and to get here. And I'm so grateful that I have it. Um, I feel like my career has like totally blossomed in the past couple of years and every day somebody thinks I'm important enough to have on like a, you know, like something like this. I'm just thrilled because, you know, hopefully that means that I'm doing work that interests people. And I just want to keep doing that and doing it to the best of my abilities. And um, yeah, so I prioritize it. And, you know, does that mean that I don't go on dates a lot? Yeah. <laughs> but it's a pandemic. I don't know how people date right now anyway. That's, a, I don't know. First of all, but it's, you know, it's not like it was great before the pandemic. So let's just blame it on that. But you know what I mean? But it's like, who cares? Because I'm doing fun, exciting work. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, people who uh, who prioritize their kids in their home life and then prioritize their writing, there's not one way to do this. But I always tell people, you're not stealing time. That time belongs to you. Take it and take it. And don't apologize for it because, um, you know, you are a person who needs to be heard from. Like your contributions to this world matter. You as a full human being matter. So go for it. Balls to the wall. Uh, labia to the wall. Labia. <laughs> that, just I just broke. pictured that and I'm like, cut oh, it, God. Cut it. <laughs> cut it up. That's as good a point as any to stop everything. But you, before that, before the laughter, you brought tears to my eyes with this, like, anthem of of solidarity and empowerment. So thank you for both yeah. that and then the laugh at the end. Um, yeah, this has just been amazing. Stick around for a second after the broadcast um, so I can say goodbye to you. But first, I'll just say, Liz, thank you so much for joining me tonight. This has been just so much fun, um, but also just really thought provoking as well. And I'm going to hold your book up one more time for anyone who missed it. Whoop, belabored a, vind a vindication of the rights of pregnant women. I always get confused by the mirroring of this platform. I know. Um, I keep turning my head the wrong way, too, because I'm I like, know. where's my good side? I don't remember where my good side is. <laughs> it's a little, like, robotic. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for everybody who tuned in. I see you, Corinne. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for, for listening. Um, now, Writer Mother Monster has a bookshop link, so you can find Liz's book there, as well as all of the books from our guests all collected together on a virtual bookshelf. Um, and if you enjoyed the show tonight, please also consider becoming a patron or patroness of Writer Mother Monster so we can keep this thing going. And um, thank you all so much. See you um, Monday for El Nash. Thank you, Liz. Bye.